Good, good, good. Well, it's great to see everybody here tonight. Welcome back to week three, our study on heaven. We've entitled it, Things Above, Mankind's Ultimate Hope. Our anchor scripture for this is Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, which, which says, Since you've been raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is at the right hand of God. Seek those things which are above in heaven and not the things on the earth. And so the scripture couldn't be clearer that we're to actually seek those things which are above and set our minds on the things which are above. Now, have you thought about this too? Jesus taught us to pray in what we call the Lord's Prayer, Matthew chapter 6, right? It's The Lord's Prayer is actually John chapter 17, but that's another issue. We'll just call it the Lord's Prayer, our Father who art in heaven. Do you know when he says there, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, where? On earth as what? It is in heaven. Now, how can we pray for God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven if we don't know what's going on up in heaven? Right? I got to know what's happening up there if I'm going to say, Lord, make some of that that's going on up there happen down here. So if I don't know what's happening in heaven, I can't pray the Lord's prayer the right way. So I just want to encourage you, this, these things that just roll off our mouths sometimes, off our lips, we need to pay better attention to them. And so, Lord, would you help us understand what's happening in heaven so that we can capture that and then pray it down here that it would happen here on the earth. So, seek those things that are above, set your minds on things that are above, and then pray those things that are above to happen here on the earth. That's all right. Jesus taught us to pray that way and to think that way and to believe that way. So it's a good thing. Anyway, just a little bit of uh, encouragement for you as we head into this. Now, 30 years ago next month, a dear, dear friend of mine, Daryl Hutchins, went to heaven unexpectedly. Uh, Daryl was 50 years old at the time. He was what they call in the biker world a one percenter. It means he was like a hell's angel kind of guy. He was a bad guy. And Jesus, in his mercy saved Daryl. Daryl's biker name was Animal, and he looked like an animal. Big old tall dude, slender, but a beard, and he would scare the bejeebers out of you if you didn't know that he loved Jesus. He was that kind of guy. Jesus got a hold of his heart and turned Animal into like this most loving guy that you could ever meet. He was a hugger. He, he would kiss me on the cheek. He went to my church in California with me. We were friends. We fished together uh, uh, in the Sierra fishing for uh, rainbow trout, and I'm telling you, now, I probably don't need to tell you this part, but I will. I mean, th this was animal. We, we would catch a fish. He would have that fish gutted and gilled, I think, before the fish even stopped flapping its mouth. He'd throw that joker on the fire. We'd be eating. I mean, it didn't get any fresher than that. He had a massive heart attack from years, decades of drug abuse. He revived a little bit, and the doctors came in and told him, because of all of the speed that you took, Doc, you can relate, you understand this, because of all the speed you took, your, your heart that should be a muscle is like a wet wash rag. There's just nothing left of it. And we got no hope for you. That's it. Daryl got out of his hospital bed, which in, in the room was now filled with his friends, and got up and hugged everyone and just said something kind to every single person that was there in the room. And then he went to heaven. It was about a month after Daryl went to heaven that I, I had a dream. I, I'm a dreamer. I, I have dreams. I had never had a dream like this before. But I had a dream with Daryl. To this day, it's one of the most vibrant, remarkable dreams I've ever had in my entire life. I had a dream that Daryl and I were walking, and in the dream, I knew that I knew that I knew that Daryl had gone to heaven and that we were in heaven, in the dream. We were walking on lunging, wonderful, just 
hills of grass that was nearly waist deep, just blowing in a gentle breeze. And the sky was as, as sky blue as you could ever hope to see. It was just a beautiful thing. And I remember looking at Daryl as we were walking in this, this glory and this beauty. I remember looking at Daryl and in the dream being so stoked that Daryl still looked like Daryl. <laughs> Except... You know, it's a dream. You don't know what to do with dreams always, except to say that he was more alive. He was vibrant. There was there was just something that was otherly. There was something that was heavenly about him, but he looked like animal. And we were walking and we were just enjoying one another without saying a word. And then we begin to hear this music. And this music was like the most beautiful, just symphony music. It wasn't hard rock. It was just this beautiful orchestral music. And then with the music came the lyrics to the song. And what I heard singing coming from somewhere over the hills, I heard the blind see, the lame walk, the deaf hear, and the dead are raised to life again. And we're walking and this music's playing and these lyrics are being sung and it's coming from over the hill over there. And it was so, it was, it was so contagious that I found myself wanting to sing along. I wanted to join in on the chorus. And as much as I could hear the music and I understood what it meant, I couldn't get it out of my mouth. Daryl, on the other hand, was singing at the top of his lungs. And I'm thinking, well, doggone it, why does he get to sing and I don't get to sing? This is a rapturous moment. We came up over this next hill and I looked and I saw what I could only describe to you as a crystal coliseum see-through, but massive. Archways, like the Colosseum in Rome, but much bigger and much more glorious, filled with thousands and thousands and thousands of people. And this is where the song was emanating from. The deaf hear and the blind see and the lame walk, and the dead are raised to life again. Just this massive moment. And I stopped right there, looked at it all, beheld it, And Daryl kept walking, and he kept on singing. And right when he got through the arch, the entryway, into this diamond crystal coliseum, he turned around and looked at me, and the song was right on the lyric, and the dead are raised to life again. He smiled at me and walked into the coliseum. And I woke up. And I woke up just like that. It captivated me so much that when I woke up in the morning, I got up and I made a recording of it because I wanted to send it to his wife, Val. I did, I made a recording of it and, and sent it to Val and um, she wrote me back. And she said, Steve, you're never going to believe what happened when I came home from Daryl's funeral. I'm gonna tell you about it in a couple weeks. And the dead are raised to life again. So tonight, beloved, after last week talking about God's resurrected people, worshiping a resurrected Christ eventually and a resurrected heaven and earth, a new heaven and a new earth, if you will. Tonight, we're going to talk about resurrected bodies, heavenly bodies. Now, I, I, this is a warning and an exhortation both. Every one of you, you have to think big. Think big tonight. Don't don't set the horizon of your expectation of heaven so low that when I tell you heavenly things tonight, you're going to go, oh, no, I don't know about that. I will kick you in the shin if you do that tonight. (laughs) 
You need to think big. You need to think biblical. You need to agree with the word and you need to let it put some hope and some happiness in you. We're talking about resurrected bodies that every single follower of Jesus is going to get at a certain time in eternal history. So if we're going to talk about resurrected bodies, we have to start with the Lord Jesus Christ. We have to answer the question, what was Christ's resurrected body like? Let's start there. Let's Starting with Jesus is always a good place to start. What was Jesus' resurrected body like? Well, let's go to the scriptures. Always the best thing to do. So, after Jesus' resurrection, John tells us part of the story. This is John chapter 20, verse 19. Then, the same day at evening, this, is, this would be resurrection Sunday in the evening. Then, the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, peace be with you. (laughs) Are you kidding me? Can I just unpack what this means? It means that they had the windows barred, the doors shut and locked because they were convinced that the Jews were coming to get him because they were followers of this renegade Jesus. The bars on the window and the locks on the doors and the thickness of the walls did not prevent the resurrected Jesus from passing through all of it and just standing in the middle of the room. Peace be with you. You might imagine that they went, "Ah!" nobody was used to that. Nobody had seen these types of things before. And yet in Jesus' resurrected body, and you have to get this if we're going to get anywhere tonight, in Jesus' resurrected body, material obstacles had no power or restraint over him. We don't know if he walked through the wall. We don't know if he came through the window. We don't know if he didn't even broached the house, but just showed up from somewhere else that he was. What we do know is they were there in the room and all of a sudden, bam, there's Jesus out of nowhere. I'm already into the resurrected body thing. I'm all for it already. Well, let's go on. Luke 24, 31. This is on the road to Emmaus after Jesus was resurrected and talking to the disciples. It said, then finally their eyes were opened and they knew him and he vanished from their sight. That means just like that, just like the way Jesus appeared in his resurrected body in the room, now he's disappearing from talking to them. We we struggle with language for this. This is this is Jesus materializing one time and dematerializing another time. This is him showing up and disappearing, appearing and disappearing. We might say exactly how this works. We don't know. I'm guessing when we get there, when we all get to heaven, we'll figure it out and we'll have an answer for it. But just for us now, I love that the scripture includes these things that at least make us scratch our head and at most put joy in our hearts about how life conquers death. How death and physical limitations do not have the final word over the children of God at all. All right, let's go on. Luke 24, 36 to 43. Now, as they said these things, here's another time where Jesus did it. Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said to them, here it is again, peace to you. Look at this. But they were terrified and frightened and supposed that they had seen a spirit. Now hold it right there. These are the disciples. These are the dudes that walk with Jesus for three years. They heard every teaching. They saw every miracle. And yet, when it came to the resurrection and his resurrection body, they couldn't deal with that. 
This is too much. Fishes and loaves, okay. Withered hands, we're in. Demon possessed, getting delivered, wonderful. You can't be showing up after raising from the dead and say peace to you without us freaking out. It's a little too much. And so here they are, they're terrified and frightened and suppose that they had seen a spirit because in, in their mind, in their economy of words and understanding, they could only attribute the resurrected body of Jesus to a spirit, to a ghost. They had no reference point. And so they're thinking that they're looking at a spirit or a ghost. And Jesus said, let's continue, why are you troubled? Well, because you appeared in the room, that's why. Why are you troubled? Look at this. And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. Now look at but while they still did not believe for joy and marveled, he said to them, do you have any food here? Has anybody read this in the Bible before? Has this seemed like the first time you've ever read this? Do you have any food here? So they gave him a piece of broiled fish and some honeycomb and he took it and he ate it in their presence. Can I just say resurrected bodies Eat like crazy. Glory to God. Now let's unpack this. First of all, they're terrified. They're frightened. They can't believe it. They think this has to be a spirit because we don't know what else to say. Surely this can't be a real human flesh and bone blood human. It can't be. That's never happened before. Until Jesus, who has to be the first fruits who has to be the first resurrected from the dead. And so there he is, resurrected from the dead. And then he says, why are you troubled? And why do you have doubts? Why do you have doubts? Because he told them over and over again, this is what's going to happen to the Son of Man. He's going to be betrayed into the hands of sinners. He's going to be crucified. He's going to be killed and buried. And on the third day, he will rise again. He told them that over and over and over again. And yet they doubted. Let me tell you something, friends. When you doubt things about the resurrection and eternal living, when you doubt those things, you know what your life's gonna be filled with? Fear. But when you believe and when you know that Jesus is the resurrection and the life and that whosoever believes in him shall never die, you've got peace. And we get to choose. Do you want to believe and have peace or do you want to doubt and be freaking out about it all? Because there's one thing that's going to face every single one of us. I don't say this lightly. One thing that's going to face every one of us, unless Jesus comes back, we're all going to have to deal with our own mortality. We're all going to have to deal with that moment where we as followers of Jesus slip into eternity. We're going to have to deal with that. And it is understanding the scriptures and the power of a resurrected life that gives us peace. I have been at the bedside of many, many people who have gone on into heaven. I have watched people who believed and had a solid walk with Jesus slip into heaven with peace and joy unspeakable and full of glory. And I've watched people with not a great faith surrounded by people of little to no faith. And I've watched torment and fear invade the room. So they're freaking out. He convinces them that it's actually him. It's his hands, it's his feet, it's I myself. Look and see, I've got flesh and bone here. Touch me, handle me. And then finally, do you have any food? And he ate it in their presence. Can I just give you one more fun Bible verse about this? Luke 22, 29 and 30. This is in red. Jesus said this. Jesus said, and I bestow upon you a kingdom just as my father bestowed one upon me that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom. 
He's just doing first with them what we're going to do for all eternity. See, everything that we do here on earth, y'all, here's all it is. It's training for reigning. It's just training now for what we're going to reign with and do in heaven forever. It, it's, it's not a total start over when we get there. Heaven is a massive, we'll talk about this in weeks to come, a massive continuation of much about us that is happening here on earth. And so Jesus shows up, he does his stuff, and he finally convinces them, hey guys, you got some, any food here? And he eats it right there in their midst in fulfillment of what he said is gonna be happening through all of eternity. All right, let's talk some more about Jesus' resurrection body. Acts chapter one, verses nine through 11. This is 50, uh, excuse me, 40 days after his resurrection. The scripture tells us that he taught them things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And after those 40 days were up, that he ascended into heaven. Acts 1, 9. Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel who also said, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up to heaven? These questions crack me up. What do you mean? Why am I standing here looking to heaven? Because Jesus is flying. He's floating, he's going up, call it whatever you want. There is a man in a resurrected body where gravity doesn't even have authority over him. <laughs> Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up to heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. This same resurrected Jesus that defies gravity, that defies walls and windows and obstacles of every kind, this same Jesus who's flying before you now, he's gonna be flying back one day. It is this same Jesus. And the scripture tells us every eye will behold him. Resurrected bodies, gravity, forget about it means nothing to a resurrected body. See, we, we struggle with these things because like the disciples, we find ourselves thinking thoughts that they, they couldn't believe for joy. It's too good to be true. That's what that literally, like, that's what that means. This resurrected life, this resurrected body with abilities that are beyond anything we ever even could imagine. It's just too good to be true. It is, but it isn't. It's Jesus. We look at a resurrected body, we look at Jesus. Jesus, glorious, powerful, resurrected body, without question, has unique abilities that we don't find ourselves setting our minds on very often. But here's where this gets awesome. Are you ready for this? Because Jesus' resurrected body that he has, you know what? We get the exact same body. <laughs> he doesn't have this to his own. He doesn't keep this just for himself and say, well, you know, I'm the Christ and so I get the resurrected body. And you guys, you guys, you know, you gotta have version two version junior the scripture could not be clearer beloved that the exact same resurrection body that G jesus lives in and functioned in is the exact same body we're going to be given get ready this is a bible study here tonight first corinthians chapter 15 verses 42 through 49 so also is the resurrection of the dead. Now this whole chapter is about the resurrection, but I'm just gonna focus on these seven verses. So also is the resurrection of the dead. Now here you go. The body, speaking of our natural body, the body is sown in corruption. That means our bodies that we have now were sown in corruption. It means decay. 
Can I get an amen? amen? Yeah, our bodies are decaying. They're sown in corruption, but it's raised in incorruption. Our resurrection body is raised in incorruption. It's raised in immortality. It's raised in perpetuity. It means that it is an eternal thing then. It's not decreasing. It's increasing forever. It's sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness or in frailty. But it's raised in power. It's sown a natural body here right now that you and I have, but it's raised a spiritual body, a spiritual body, a resurrected body, a body that's filled with the resurrection power of Jesus that Paul writes here, the only thing I can tell you is that it's spiritual. There's nothing natural about a resurrected body apart from how it looks. He said there's a natural body and there's a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam, who is Christ, became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, and afterward the spiritual. The first man, Adam, was of the earth, and he was made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As was the man of the dust, so also are those who are made of the dust. In other words, we're made in the image of Adam. And as is the heavenly man, Jesus, so also are those who are heavenly. We share in Adam's dusty body. We share in Jesus' resurrection body. And as we have born the image of the man of the dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. This word for image here, we get our our English word icon from it. It It is a likeness, listen to me now, not just in body, but in spirit and in mind. I get that we typically go for, man, it's great. Someone went to heaven and their pain's gone and the, their, whatever ailment they had, they're not suffering with now. I, I get that most of the time we think about physical issues. But friends, I want to tell you about mental issues. There are people right now who are suffering with mental illness. It's not their fault. We've all been born into a fallen world. They're struggling with mental illness. I'm here to tell you, if that's you in this room or any friends that you have that follow Jesus, mental illness is not in your eternity because we will take the image of the heavenly man and it's not just in body, it is in mind as well. God is going to completely give a work over to us. It is an ultimate extreme makeover. Body, mind, and spirit. This is why the gospel's good news. So just like we partook of Adam and his dust in our natural bodies, we get to partake of Jesus and his resurrection in our spiritual bodies. Incorruptible, glorious, spiritual, full of power, resurrected bodies. As you might imagine, it leads to some interesting things, some sanctified imagination within the confines of biblical truth. Let me look at some, show you some other scriptures here. Philippians chapter three, verses 20 and 21. Paul writes here and says, for our citizenship is in heaven, hallelujah, from which we also, listen, eagerly wait for the Savior. Is anybody eagerly waiting for Jesus to come back? I'd be thrilled if he came back before I finish the next sentence. We eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus, who will what? Transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. More verses that prove 
we're going to have the exact same type of resurrection body that Jesus had. Paul understood it. John also understood it. 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. Beloved, now we are children of God and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. Look at this. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We shall be like him. We have the same resurrected body that Jesus has. It's all throughout the scripture. I just gave you three verses right there. Spiritual, full of glory and power, incorruptible, untainted by sin, enabled, empowered by God's glory. So when we start thinking about this again, there, 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 there is nothing not even the slightest tinge of it. There is nothing that is feeble, weak, sick, or challenged in any way in our body or in our mind when we get our resurrected body. We have to to remember that. I mean, listen. We look at some people now... I was struggling with this earlier today, trying to figure out how to, how to ask you this, but here, here you go. I want you to imagine whoever you think is like the most perfect specimen of a human being. This is gonna be holy. the most perfect specimen of beauty or of handsomeness or whatever you want, just the most striking, what a a physical specimen, we might say. Do you know that what you're looking at in that beauty is a fallen creature? A natural body? A body that is filled with corruption and decay? And it looks pretty good for a while, even in this most beautiful, handsome person. But then you got to go get a little work done. You got to get this. You got to get that just to try to keep it up. And if you're not careful, you end up looking like you're in a wind tunnel that's 500 miles an hour. Right? I'm not decaying. I'm not decaying. I don't know what mirror those people are looking in. <laughs> What's the point of all that? The point is this. At our absolute best, in our human natural condition, is nothing compared to our resurrected bodies in heaven. Nothing doesn't compare in the slightest. And so when we're talking about our resurrected bodies, we have to get rid of the notion that somehow our resurrected body is just a little bit better than what we've got now. And we might be able to do just a few things differently. No, it's going to be infinitely better with abilities and capabilities that our minds can't even conceive right now. Set your mind on these things. Think on these things. No more feeble, weak, sick, decaying, challenged, anything. So you got to ask yourself the question and have some fun and some wonder. What might we do in our resurrected bodies? If they are so pure and untainted from sin, if they are so glorious and so filled with God's power, what might we be able to do in our resurrected bodies? Everything that Jesus did because we have the exact same body and more. What is the more? We don't know what the more is. We struggle with this. It's hard to imagine possibilities that we, de- that we don't even know exist. How can I tell you about something that I don't know if it exists? You can't. It, it makes no sense. I can, I can try to take what the scripture says about resurrection, life, and living and then just magnify it with definitions that we would apply here on earth, 
But what about things that we don't even know exist? How can we? It would be like taking someone who is blind, who speaks English, and you start them off in a pitch black room and you tell them, okay, right now you're, you're in a pitch black room. And then you take them to a room and you tell them, hey, you know what this room is and it's pitch black. Do you get it? They're not gonna get it because they can't imagine what they've never experienced. And then if they spoke English and you tried to explain it to them in Spanish, it's just that much more inconceivable. You see, there are things about heaven and things about our resurrected life that are inconceivable to us here on earth. This is when we can say, I has not seen nor has ear heard the things that God has prepared for those who love him, but he has revealed some of those things to us by his spirit. We get to have fun with some of this stuff that's clearly in the scripture that our resurrected bodies are gonna be like, but ultimately, we can't describe things that we don't know exist. Is that awesome? Amen. See, I, I, I am convinced that it is things like this that will cause us for all of eternity to be able to sing one word, worthy. Another word, holy. Because in God's eternal kingdom where we're going to have resurrected bodies, I am convinced that resurrection, heavenly living, it is always and forever just another facet on a diamond with more beauty and more glory than we saw with the last twist or turn of it. And it is going to be so magnificent that every time we see God twist the beauty of his glorious creation. We're not gonna be able to do anything but say hallelujah. It'll be like we saw it for the first time. It's not me singing hallelujah for the thousandth time about the same thing. It's me for the first time singing hallelujah for another facet of resurrection, life, and living in a kingdom that has no end. When do we get these resurrected bodies? We just saw in Philippians 3, 20 and 21, and in 1 John 3, 2, we get these resurrected bodies at his return. Now, some people want to say, hey, that's at the rapture. Other people want to say that's at the second coming of Christ. I'm not here to argue that or make that point. It's not the part of the study. But when Jesus gathers us to himself, we are going to get our resurrected bodies. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Those who have passed before us when Jesus comes back get their resurrected bodies first, and those people who are alive and remain will get those right then, immediately after that. When he comes to gather us to himself, that's when we get a resurrected body. Until then, like we talked about last week, heaven now and heaven new. Right now, what body do people have in heaven? What's their body like? It's like the bodies in Revelation chapter six and verse and chapter seven. They are bodies that are real and tangible. They're recognizable. They're people from all tribes, tongues, and nations. They're people right now who know things in heaven that are happening here on earth. They're people who are resting there, who are serving there, who are worshiping there. They're not hungering or thirsting there in their non-resurrected body, but a spiritual body nonetheless. They're not experiencing any discomfort at all, and God himself is wiping tears away from their eyes, and God himself is living in their midst. That's why I don't make a huge deal about when this actually happens, when we actually get our final resurrected body, because the body that we get right now when we go to be home with the Lord is so far beyond anything I'm experiencing now, I'd even settle for that body. <laughs> Ask this question. Are you all with me still? Is this okay? All right. People ask the question, what age are you in heaven? 
what age do you think you are? I remember years ago, I asked my sweet daughter, Destiny, Destiny, what age do you think people are in heaven? And she thought about it for a second. She was a teenager at the time. I was kind of proud of her being my kid and all. She said, Dad, I think people in heaven are the healthiest that they ever were on earth. That's how old they are in heaven. And I said, you don't even realize how close you are to what theologians have said for 2,000 years. Because the greatest theologians throughout church history have made comments like this. Your, your DNA is at its best when, they're, when you're in your 20s and 30s. And when your DNA is at its absolute best, that's probably the age that you're going to be in heaven. Plus, Jesus was 33. So maybe we'll be about the age of Jesus in our resurrected bodies. How old will you be then? Maybe. I'm not going to fight anybody about it. But I'm glad I'm not going to be 60. <laughs> I'll take 33. <laughs> how, about, how about this? Isaiah chapter 11, verses 6 through 9. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the young goat. The calf and the young lion and the, and the fatling together. Look at this. And a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze. Their young ones shall lie down together. And the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole. And the wean child shall put his hand in the viper's den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Anything stand out to you all in that passage? We're talking about age. It says right here, in the kingdom, there's going to be nursing children there. Some of you moms who are here, heaven is so unbelievably redemptive that you may just get the honor of nursing your child that you lost. You may just be able to raise your child in heaven. Nursing children, young children, little children, they're there. Do they kind of stay that age until the resurrection happens and then they jump up to 33? <laughs> Do they stay that age until they meet mom and dad again or brother and sister? I don't know. The scripture doesn't tell us. But it tells us that there's children there. And it tells us that there's nothing there. that does them harm. What a good God. What a good God. Do you know, beloved, nobody twist God's arm and told him, make heaven awesome or else. God just said, this whole concept of heaven and a new heaven and a new earth you know what you understand about sinless, incredible Eden? The new heaven and the new earth is going to be like Eden on steroids. And I'm doing it for you, my redeemed children, because I love you and I've loved you forever. And I am preparing this place for you as much as I'm preparing you for this place. I want to end by reading just a little short story from a book that's meant a lot to Sarah and I for over 30 years. The name of the book originally was written in the eight, late 1800s, 1895 or 1898, I believe. The original name of it was Intramuros, Intramuros, the Latin for inside the gate or within the gate. Rebecca Reuter Springer had an experience that what we would say now is a near-death experience, which I have redeemed and call these things near-life experiences. 
she was tremendously sick and she had an experience with, with God. And what I love about her in this beginning of the book, she doesn't try to argue her point. She doesn't try to convince anybody. She just said, I'm just telling you what happened to me and you can do with it what you want. So she finds herself in heaven. She meets her brother. And when she first gets there, they come to a river and her brother wants to invite her into the river. And now let me just read this to you. The brother said, come, I want to show you the river. When we reached the brink of the river, but a few steps distant, I found that the lovely sward ran even to the water's edge, the sward, the grass, short manicured grass. And in some places I saw flowers blooming placidly down in the depths of the river among the many colored pebbles with which the entire bed of the river was lined. I want you to see these beautiful stones, said my brother, stepping into the water and urging me to do the same. I drew back timidly, saying, I fear it is cold. Not in the least, he said, with a reassuring smile. Come. Just as I am, I said, glancing down at my lovely robe, which to my great joy I found was similar to those of the dwellers in that happy place. Just as you are, with another reassuring smile. I sat down in the midst of the many colored pebbles and filled my hands with them as a child would have done. My brother lay down upon them as he would have done on the green grass and he laughed and talked joyously with me. Having stepped into the river to my great surprise, I found the water in both temperature and density almost identical with the air. Deeper and deeper grew the stream as we passed on until I felt the soft, sweet ripples playing around my throat. As I stopped, my brother said, a little farther still. It'll go over my head, I expostulated. Well, what then? I can't breathe under the water. I'll suffocate. An amused twinkle came into his eyes, though he said soberly enough, we do not do those things here. <laughs> we don't suffocate in heaven. We walk into the river. And she goes on to say, it was shocking to me that I could breathe and talk and listen under the water as much as I could up above the water. Now, if I would have started with that story tonight, you all would have written me off for the last 45 minutes. <laughs> but now I've at least got you thinking heavenly. Now I at least have you thinking a little bit resurrection body-ish. Finally, I'll close with this where she said, there as I laid on the pebbles and looked up through the water, I thought to myself, Where's my towel? <laughs> Only a chick, right? Where's my towel? And then I realized how foolish, to my shock, the minute my head pierced through the surface, my hair was immediately dry. And as more and more my body was exposed to the air, not just my hair or my skin, but my robe also was dry immediately as I walked out of the life-giving river. Listen, y'all. <laughs> I'm telling you that based on the scripture that I see of the glory and power of a resurrected body, and the goodness of God and the things that he's prepared for us. I read that and say, bring it on. I read that and say, I can't wait. I read that and say, we've got to get as many people to heaven as possible. I read that and say, I refuse 
to grieve like those who have no hope. I'm going to grieve. I'm going to cry for my friends that I'm going to miss seeing them face to face. But if they're lovers and followers of Jesus, I'm going to rejoice because they return to their father. Therefore, beloved, comfort one another with these words. Shall we pray? Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the resurrection and the life. Again, God, we pray that you would seal this truth in all of our hearts, in our spirits, in our minds. That we wouldn't allow the enemy to steal one bit of this truth, one bit of this hope, one bit of this joy. Lord, we say before you and the angels in heaven that we will commit ourselves to seek those things which are above and to set our minds on those things which are above. Father, in the name of Jesus, would you continue to make us so heavenly minded that we would be here some earthly good. May we invite, may we impact as many people as we possibly can to experience the reality of heaven. In Jesus' mighty name, the happy resurrected Son of God. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Isn't God good? Glory to God. Hallelujah forevermore. We'll see you Sunday. Go out and love a bunch of people. Make Jesus famous. God bless you guys. <laughs>